And now we come to the point where we can continue our story based on the ancient book of Daniel. Today we come to chapter 3, and this is quite a long chapter, so I'm not going to read it to you, but I'll be happy to give you an overview of it and then see what practical lessons we can learn from it. Let me just bring you up to date with the story of Daniel so far. You remember that the people of God living in Jerusalem and Judah had repeatedly refused to do what God told them to do, and he had sent the prophets and warned them that judgment was going to come unless they repented. They didn't repent, and judgment came in the shape and form of King Nebuchadnezzar and his powerful Babylonian army. Eventually, Jerusalem was overthrown, but before it was overthrown, Nebuchadnezzar took many of the key people from Jerusalem back to Babylon with him. He was an incredibly cruel man, as we'll see as the story unfolds, and yet he seemed to have some rather enlightened policies as well. The Assyrians, uh, they simply destroyed everything before them and then put their own people in places like Israel. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that in Judah. He took the key people in order to train them in Babylonian thinking, in Babylonian education, and then he wanted them to span out into the far reaches of the Babylonian empire and, and rule on his behalf. With this in mind, he picked some of the key young Jewish people, uh, including Daniel and three of his friends. And these, these four young men were given what basically amounted to a full three-year scholarship to the University of Babylon in order to study Babylon literature and Babylonian culture. And the, the intention was that when they were through, they would go into the court and serve in the diplomatic court. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, the Babylonians were very much committed to was the interpretation of dreams. They believed that the gods spoke to them in their dreams. And one day Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that deeply troubled him. Um, it was uh, so troubling that he called together his uh, expert uh, dream interpreters and told them two things. Number one, he said, tell me what the dream was. And number two, tell me the interpretation. They remonstrated with him and said, nobody can do that. Only the gods could do that sort of thing. And they don't dwell among men. And he said, if you don't tell me what the dream was and interpret it for me, then I will cut you in little pieces and destroy your homes. That was the way he dealt with things that displeased him. Uh, they were unable to do anything. And so a holocaust uh, developed. Uh, Daniel and his friends, of course, uh, were included in that number, but Daniel and his friends prayed about it. God gave them insight into the dream and an interpretation of it, and Daniel was able to come uh, to the king and, uh, in, in a remarkable way, give him the dream and also its interpretation. The dream uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed was about a great statue. The head of it was made of gold, the chest was made of silver, the belly and the thighs were made of bronze, the legs were made of iron, but the feet were made of clay. Hence the expression, to have feet of clay. And in the dream, a small stone, not cut with human hands, began to roll down towards the statue, gathered momentum and size, crashed into the statue, toppled it, ground it into dust, and the wind blew it all away. And the interpretation of the dream that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar was simply this. You, King Nebuchadnezzar, and your Babylonian kingdom are the head of gold. But there will be succeeding kingdoms after you, and eventually they will all be toppled, and none of the kingdoms of this world will survive, but only this remarkable kingdom that Daniel called the kingdom of God will survive. And this kingdom he said, will be set up by the God of heaven, and it will never be destroyed. Now, that was a, a dramatic prophetic statement, and it is contained for us in Scripture. And we do well to think of those, those words. But what God is really saying through the prophet Daniel and through the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had is something that we in this day need to bear in mind. We put great confidence and we put great hope in the kingdoms manufactured by men in all their ingenuity. But one kingdom after another will come and it will go. And as we look at human history, 
What is it really all about? It is the story of kingdoms that rose and fell, the decline and fall of one kingdom after another, one superpower after another. And Scripture tells us that in the end, finally, only God's kingdom will prevail. The result of this vision that was given to Nebuchadnezzar uh, was that he um, made some uh, protestations and, and some testimony uh, to accepting the vision. But then in chapter 3, uh, things turn right round again. And he makes a huge, huge statue made of gold. We don't know whether it was solid gold or whether it was gold-plated. And then he sent word out to all the peoples and all the nations and all the language groups in his vast empire, and he told everybody that when the signal of music was given, they were all, without exception, to bow down to this statue. Uh, he then went on to say that if anybody chose not to do it, there was a fiery furnace heated up to receive them, and they would be burned alive. We can, we can see the cruel streak in Nebuchadnezzar again. Uh, the word came to Nebuchadnezzar that three of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had quietly desisted. They, they had quietly determined they were not going to buy down uh, to this uh, statue. They were not going to serve the Babylonian gods. And uh, the people came and told Nebuchadnezzar this. He was furious, called these three young men in, and he said, don't you realize that you are in deep trouble? And if you don't do what I say, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. And then he said, and if I do that, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That gives you another insight into Nebuchadnezzar. He thought he was so powerful that no God could rescue anybody from his hand. In other words, his hand was more powerful than the God's. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego declined to answer him, and they simply uh, to, declined to respond to that particular statement. They thought it was quite outrageous, and uh, they simply said, our God is able to deliver us, uh, and we believe that he will, but for the sake of argument, if he doesn't, we're still not going to do what you say. And so they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and turns to his people and said, didn't we throw three of them in there? He apparently had short memory. And they said, yes. And he said, then I see four people. The angel of the Lord is with them. So he brings them out. Not only are they not burned, even though the soldiers who threw them in were burned alive, he brings them out, not only not burned, but their clothes are not even singed. And he then makes a pronouncement. And he says that there's no other God can save in the way that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, can save. Therefore, no one must say anything against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And if they do, guess what? They will be cut in little pieces and their houses will be destroyed. Very nice gentleman, this Nebuchadnezzar. All right, that's the story. Now then, there's some lessons, I believe, that we can glean from this particular passage of Scripture. I want you to notice, first of all, what happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life. <coughs> I, I want to suggest to you that he had what I would call, for want of a better term, a convenient conversion. He had what I would call, for want of a better term, a convenient conversion. Now, when he was deeply troubled by the first dream and didn't know what to do about it, and his helpers couldn't help him, and then Daniel interpreted it for him and told him, to his intense delight, that he was the head of gold and that his Babylonian kingdom was absolutely wonderful. When, when that happened, uh, he responded to the message. He even responded to the message that no kingdoms on earth would survive and only the kingdom of God would survive. He even responded to the message that the rock cut without hands would become the great mountain of the purposes of God. And the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold would be smashed to pieces. He responded to all that, and this is what he said in verse 47 of chapter 2. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, a reveal of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Now, what he's saying, in effect, is absolutely staggering. You see, he was a Babylonian. The Babylonians had a pantheon of gods. Now, they had some rather vague concept of God Most High. 
In other words, there was this great pantheon of gods, every size and shape and variety of god you could imagine, but supervising all this pantheon of gods was a god most high. Uh, he was ill-defined, but what Nebuchadnezzar actually says and says publicly is this, the god of Daniel is god most high. He is the god of gods. Now, for Nebuchadnezzar to say that was really tantamount to him saying, my religious thinking needs complete revision. What I have believed religiously up to this time has been in error. And I have to admit that I was completely wrong about who God really is. And in saying that the God of Daniel is the God of gods, what he was actually saying was, I testify to the fact that the one true God is the God of Daniel. Oh, if you want to use our terminology, he was saying, I want to testify to the fact that even though I, was, I grew up in a situation believing lots of other things, I have come to this solid conviction, and it is this, that the God of the Bible the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He is God of gods. That is a powerful statement to make. The second thing that in this statement that is very, very strategic and very, very important is this, that he also says that God is the Lord of kings. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a big-time king. In fact, he would, could quite legitimately have claimed to be king of kings. He had simply steamrolled over all the other kingdoms in the area, and he'd ma amassed them into a vast, vast empire, and he was, in effect, king of kings. But now what he's saying is this, I fully recognize that I'm the king around here, and I have steamrolled lots of other kings around here, but even the king of kings has a lord over him. And I'm prepared to admit it. Powerful though I am, rich though I am, successful though I am, I am prepared to admit that the God of Daniel is God of gods and Lord of kings. Now, I'll tell you something. For a Nebuchadnezzar to make a statement like that, something really significant is happening. He's having some kind of a spiritual renewal. He's having, for want of a better term, some kind of of a spiritual conversion. Why then do I call it a convenient conversion? Well, uh, because I've read chapter 3. And when I read chapter 3, I, I find that an entirely different Nebuchadnezzar is showing up. The Nebuchadnezzar who shows up now is the Nebuchadnezzar who says, um, well, uh, uh, I'm going to erect this gold uh, statue we don't know whether it was a statue of himself or a statue of one of the gods, but what we do know is that he was erecting something that required universal worship. And he was erecting it, and he was demanding universal worship. Now, I want you to notice the significance of this. He has said that the God of Daniel is God of gods and the Lord of kings. When it served his purposes, that was what he said. When he got out of the God of gods and the Lord of kings what he wanted, that was what he said. But now the situation has changed. I mean, he's away from that troubling situation. Things have settled down a little bit. He's kind of got control of the situation a bit better. And so now uh, he's sort of revamping what he thinks. Now he's changing things around just a little bit. And so whilst in the interpretation of the dream he acknowledges that he is the head of gold, now he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a complete statue of gold and I'm going to get everybody to worship there. What's he saying? He's saying, well, you know, when Daniel said that, that my kingdom would pass away and all the other kingdoms would pass away and only the kingdom of God would survive, when, God, when he said that, I kind of went along with that, but in actual fact... What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I'm not just the head of gold, but I'm going to make sure that I'm the whole thing of gold, that I have got everything under control. And whilst I kind of went along with the idea that God's kingdom alone would prevail, I am going to make sure that my kingdom survives. 
as well. It's rather interesting to notice that when he heard about the, the interpretation of the dream from, from Daniel, he agreed uh, with this feet of clay thing. And he says the people are going to be very difficult to rule and kingdoms and, and superpowers will collapse for the very simple reason that people will not remain united any more than iron and clay will remain united. And he, he admits that that is what is going to happen, but now he's changed that. And this is what he's saying. Well, yeah, I, I kind of went along with that idea that, you know, people wouldn't be united and kingdoms would collapse and only the kingdom of God would prevail. But, well, now what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to make sure that while God says people won't be united, I'm going to unite them. I'm going to tell all the kingdoms and all the peoples and all the nations that they've all got to gather in the same place and they've all got to come before the same God and they've all got to bow and down before the same God. I'll unite them. Not only will I unite them, I will unite them around my system. Oh dear. What is happening to King Nebuchadnezzar? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. He's having a convenient conversion. He is having a wonderful conversion that gets all excited about God when God delivers, but when he begins to discover what it really means that God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, he discovers that he doesn't want God to be the God of gods, and he doesn't want God to be the Lord of kings. What he wants is enough of God to get what he wants out of God, just so long as he can keep control himself. Familiar? And this world has no shortage of people who've had convenient conversions, who begin to treat God's truth with selective indifference. They believe the bits they want, and they carefully ignore the bits they don't want. They will gladly endorse the things that bring blessing, but they will carefully avoid the things that require change. And it is not unusual and it is not uncommon to find people who at one stage of their lives have made powerful professions concerning God, but as time has gone on, we begin to discover that there was more sound than substance. And we do well to learn from Nebuchadnezzar, the man who had a convenient conversion. Well, that was the situation, and now he introduces the statue, and now he runs into a problem with these three precocious young Jews. Uh, they, they don't make a big song and dance about not bowing down to the statue. They don't go out and march down Main Street Babylon. They don't go on television in Babylon and make an announcement that they absolutely refuse to do this thing. That's not necessary. They just quietly don't do what he said. But there's a problem. There's a problem here because, you see, there's some people who are very jealous of these three young guys because they're going right to the top. And the reason they're going right to the top is that they have honored the Lord. And there are some people who don't like to see these three young Jews getting into that position. So they go to King Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what he say, and I quote, there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of, Dan of Babylon. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You set up the image of gold. You set up these three young men. What you need to know, your majesty, is this. You set them up, but they're not doing what you told them to do. You'll always find that when God honors people, there are other people who get upset about it. You'll always find it. That's part of the cost of being a disciple. And so the three young men are hauled in before the king. And it's fascinating to see what happens because he begins to bluster and he begins to threat, which, of course, is the vocabulary of the tyrant and the dictator. And he says, do you realize what, what I can do to you? <coughs> Have you any idea what lies ahead of you if you persist in this particular approach that you're taking, why don't you listen to what I'm saying? And they said, yes, we fully understand what you said, that you've got this fiery furnace and that you plan to put us in there. And he said, and don't you understand that if I put you in that fiery furnace, no God will be able to rescue you from my hand. 
Do you understand how powerful I am? Nebuchadnezzar is saying. Do you realize that all the gods on this earth and all the gods in heaven and all the gods that you worship, do you understand something? That if I put you under my control, there isn't a god on the face of heaven or earth that can save you? Do you realize that? What an incredible thing for any human being to say. But that's how human beings talk. That's how human beings talk. And, and that's how many human beings think. And I'll tell you why. Because many people think that the powers that we really have to be concerned about are human powers. The powers that we really have to be concerned about are institutional powers. The powers that really govern our lives are, are political powers. And because we think this, we say we've got to manipulate the humans. We've got to manipulate the institutions. We've got to manipulate the political powers. And we forget something. That in actual fact, there is a God who is perfectly capable of delivering people from all human institution and political bondage. But we have to decide if we believe it or not. And human beings all the time will say things like this, should I do this, what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? The response of these young men was simply to treat with utter disdain this preposterous suggestion, and they said there's absolutely no necessity for us to answer that question. <laughs> Don't you like their, their cool? There's absolutely no necessity, Your Majesty, for us to answer that question. It reminds me of Jesus. You remember when he was uh, being tried and in this illegal trial that he had, and they brought him before the high priest, and the high priest starts peppering him with questions that Jesus didn't answer? So they shipped him off to Pilate, and Pilate starts to pepper him with questions, and Jesus didn't answer. There comes a point when there's no need to answer some of the things that people demand of you. As far as Jesus was concerned, he said, I've told you the truth. I don't need to reiterate it. I don't need to debate it. I don't need to argue it. If you want to argue it, go right ahead, argue with yourself. But as far as I'm concerned, I've told you the truth. Do what you will with it. As far as these young men are concerned, they're saying, to, they're, they're saying in effect to the king, Your Majesty, you can argue and bluster and threaten and you can heat your fiery furnace as much as you like. It won't change a thing. For our God, and you need to understand this, Your Majesty, our God is able to deliver us from your hand. He is God of gods. Remember, Your Majesty? He is Lord of Kings. Remember, Your Majesty? And we actually believe what we believe. Now you see the contrast between a Nebuchadnezzar and the three young men. The one makes a profession of belief that conveniently can be shelved when he wants to do something else. The three young men have a conviction of belief that they hold to and they stand firm in when the fiery furnace faces them. Our God is able to deliver us, and we believe he will. If, however, for the sake of argument he doesn't, we want you to know, Your Majesty, with all due respect, there's no way that we will bow down to your statue, and there is no way that you will make us serve your gods. Now, some people would call this drawing a line in the sand. Some people would, would call it digging in your heels. Some, some people would call it a matter of principle and a matter of conviction. Some people would call it character on display. And some people would call it sheer pig-headedness. And some people would say, what's the big deal anyway? It's only a statue. And if you've got to choose between frying in that fiery furnace and just bowing down to this stupid statue, it's a no-brainer. Why in the world would you want to waste three young lives frying in a fiery furnace when to avoid it, all you've got to do is sort of, you know, just bob your head and say, yeah, I worship. You know, it can't hear anything, it doesn't mean anything. You cross your fingers if you want to when you do it. Yeah, I believe, you know, big deal, you know. 
This is, this is ridiculous. Three fine young men. What a waste. What a waste to think that they would throw their lives away on a thing like this. Does this sound familiar, this kind of talk? Does this sound a little bit like where we are now, where we don't really understand people who say there are principles, there are positions, there are things upon which I take my stand, there are places that I will not go, there are things that I will not do, and I do it out of conviction, and my convictions serve to produce in me character. I just don't go along with the crowd because sometimes I think the crowd is wrong. I don't just march along to your drummer because sometimes I hear a different drumbeat, and I'll march to a different drummer. And that's what the three men, the three young men, decided to do. But why? Why in the world would they do it? Well, just let's interview them. <clears throat> just before they're going in, we go up with our microphone and we, we ask them the question that you always ask when you have a microphone in your hand. Uh, how do you feel? Well, we're just a little nervous. Uh -huh. Yeah, it looks pretty hot down there. Any indication of what the temperature is in there? No, we don't know, but, but the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very hot. Well, why in the world are you doing this? <clears throat> uh, Ten Commandments. The what? Ten Commandments. Oh, those are things that they argue in Congress about whether we can put on school walls. Uh, yeah, and the Supreme Court says we can't. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's only stuff they stick on the wall, isn't it? Nobody reads them. I mean, Ted Turner says that they're really ten suggestions, doesn't he? Uh, well, well, no, we, we take them seriously. Well, well, why do you take them seriously? Well, we take them seriously because we believe that there's fundamental principles that God ordained for all time for his people. Uh -huh. Well, is there any particular one that's your favorite? Well, right now, yes. Um, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Well, well, who said that? Well, God said that. He did? Yeah. Well, why did he say that? Well, he said because he's jealous. God. Oh, God's jealous? Well, it means he's zealous for his own reputation. Well, well how, how come? Well, God looks at it this way. He, he, says, he, he says that people should not confuse the creator with what he's created. There's all the difference in the world between a creator and a created. I mean, if, 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 you get a, if, if you get a craftsman who builds a table, no one's going to confuse the table with, with, the, with the cabinet maker. You, if you get a musician who composes some music, nobody's going to confuse the musician with the music. So when you think in terms of God, who's the creator, you never confuse him with the created. But what happens with human beings, sometimes it's incredible about human beings, but human beings actually get more interested in the created than the creator. And, and, and in fact, they get so much bound up with the created as opposed to the creator that, that they actually begin to worship the created and ignore the creator. In fact, they will actually go so far, in effect, to make all their dependence and all their aspirations and all their longings to be focused in that which God has created and utterly ignore he who is the creator. In fact, they will even go so far as to say the creator doesn't exist, only the created matters. <laughs> now, the, the young men say, sorry, we can't talk anymore, we've got to go. And they get thrown in the fiery furnace. But the interviewer is scratching his head and he's saying, you know, that's weird. That, that, that's kind of weird. That, that they believe so firmly that the Creator is superior to the created that they would never allow anything that God has created to take the place of God. And what those young men are actually saying, and they're in the fiery furnace now because of it, what they're actually saying is this, that if you make anything that God has created more important than the Creator who made it, that's idolatry. And it's the ultimate insult to God and the essence of our sin. 
And that's why they won't do it. Makes you think when you come across people who think like that. Now, I've, I've got to confess something to you here as a preacher. Let me make a preacher's confession to you. When you get to something like this, there's an awful temptation for the preacher now to take off on all his favorite hobby horses and say how these are our idols. What are the idols in America today? What are the idols of the people who live in the suburbs today? And I've got some great news for you. I'm going to resist the temptation. It will cost me dearly. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself, who is it or what is it that is more important to me than the God who gave them to me? If you can put a name on it, that's your idol. And remember that idolatry is the ultimate insult to God. And there are some people of character, and there are some people of principle, and there are some people of conviction, and they say, as far as my Lord and my Savior is concerned, He is my Lord, and He is my Savior, and I draw the line at what you're asking me to do, because to do it would be to deny Him. Listen, and I'd rather die than deny him. What in our world, in our modern culture, do we believe is worth living for? What are the convictions, what are the principles that we consider become, that we consider as the dominant themes of our life? I'll tell you, you can find out what they are if you ask the question, not what are the things I consider worth living for, but what are the things that I'd be willing to die? These young men make a confident assertion. And they're thrown into the fiery furnace. And when King Nebuchadnezzar, looking through his little peephole, specially designed for him so he can observe what's happening to the people he's thrown in the fiery furnace, when he looks inside, he turns to his authority, to the people with him, and he said, didn't we put three of them in there? He said, yeah. He said, there's four of them. He said, get them out of there quick. Get them out of there quick. And they get them out, and not only are they not burned, their clothes aren't even singed. And he gains some insights. And let me remind you what the insights are. Insight number one from this story. God does not promise to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He does commit to save us in the heat. I'll give you that again. God does not commit to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He does commit to save us in the heat. The tendency that we have when the fiery furnace comes into our lives or when we're thrown into the fiery furnace of a fallen world, the tendency that we have at that point is to pray, Oh, God! Get me out of this furnace. Get me out of this furnace. I don't like the heat. Get me out of it, God. And sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. But one thing he will always be prepared to do, and it is this. If he gets you out of it, or if he doesn't get you out of it, one thing he promises is that he will save you in it. Because, you see, what we usually want in the fiery furnace is our circumstances to be changed. What God wants in the fiery furnace is for us to be changed. Our prayer, change my circumstances. God's desire, no. Let me change you. And let me use the circumstances to do the changing. Peter picked up on this idea in his first epistle. He talked to the people who were very, very shortly going to come under the iniquitous regime of Nero. 
And he said, now you mustn't be surprised at the things that are going to happen to you, the fiery trial that is going to come your way, for this fiery trial that is going to come your way is going to test your faith, listen, which is more precious than gold that perishes. Do you, is, your, is your faith more precious than all your money? Than all your investment? Is your faith more precious than gold that perishes? Could, could you actually say, as Martin Luther said, and we sang with great enthusiasm because the organ was really going great guns and we were carried along with it, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, one little word shall fail him. Is, is that your faith or is uh, your faith in Wall Street? Are you worried about Y2K? It's going to happen. Who's going to deliver us from the hands of the God? Why do gay? Or are we able to say, God, if my health goes, and if my goods go, and even if I lose some who are nearest and dearest to me, one thing will never go. And it is my confidence that you work all things First lesson, he doesn't save us from the fiery furnace, he saves us in the heat. Lesson number two, weren't there three men we put in that furnace? Yes. How come there are four now? Well, I guess the reason is because God has promised, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And whatever happens, you can always count on this. The immediate presence of of the living God who does not leave you to struggle through on your own, but the gracious, powerful presence of a God who is in control of the universe. The Lord Jesus, in his final instruction to his disciples, said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. And remember this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And the young men come out of the fiery furnace and say, well, he sure didn't serve us from it, but he did serve us in it, save us in it. And the great thing was this, we discovered him in that situation in ways we'd never known him before. In fact, there's absolutely no way we could have known him with us in the fiery furnace without a fiery furnace furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks at this and he said, these young men were willing to lay down their lives. These young men were willing to lay down their lives. And they would say, yes, we were willing to lay down our lives because we were convinced of this one thing. He that honors me, says the Lord, I will honor. He that honors me, says the Lord, I will honor. And if we are called to lay down our lives for the sake of honoring him, we will do so because we know he would never, ever desert us. And in the eternal economy, it would be worthwhile. You know what I believe? I believe we're desperately in need in our culture that flip-flops Whichever the way the wind is blowing, I believe we need God to raise up some Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes. And we sure don't need any more Nebuchadnezzars. Let's pray together. Your God, our Heavenly Father, we have to admit that like Nebuchadnezzar, there's always a tendency for us to be thrilled with you when you bless us, but to begin to backtrack and renege, have second thoughts, revamp, when we begin to discover the realities of commitment to you. And I pray for anybody here today who's had a convenient conversion. 
And I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would help them to think through what it really means to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God's appointed Lord, that he calls upon us to yield every department of our lives to his gracious Lordship in order that we might experience his saving grace. And Lord, we recognize that many of our sisters and brothers here are going right out of this place into the fiery furnace of their everyday lives. It's perfectly understandable that many of them have been asking, Lord, turn off the heat. Get me out of this furnace. Change my circumstances. And perhaps some of them are going to say, Lord, give me the assurance that you're with me in these circumstances. And before you change the circumstances, change me. That I might become more like the person you want me to be. Lord, you hear these simple prayers. You respond to them. And we're glad. And we go on our way renewed and refreshed because we have come to meet with you, to sing your praises, to present our positions, and to hear your word. Thank you for deigning to meet with us this day. May we live the rest of the day and the rest of the week till we meet again in the conscious enjoyment of you walking with us in our furnace, whether fiery or not. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.